that that work. Celebrate, celebrate it. Party boy, celebrate it, John. I got. We have a junk ton of information to get to today. If you, uh, if you're a keen observer, you see that I clearly have an activity set up for us that involves skills. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to that as well. Like, work with me for some information receiving, and let's get to this fun activity. I think it'll Ill illuminate uh, a lot of our information today. But. Um, what do you notice about your notes that's maybe different from the past? What you, yes, and girls. What do you notice about your notes? There are a lot. They're multi-page, okay? This is that hefty of a lesson. So really with no further ado, giddy up, let's go. Here we go. Causes of the American Revolution. This is a, uh, this is a bit of a review from yesterday. Following the end of the French and Indian War, what we have established is the, the line that is the proclamation of 17, uh, excuse me, six, 1763. And what does that proclamation state? What, what are colonists not allowed to do? Most yeah, explore west of that line. What was that line actually on? The Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, there it is, the Appalachian Mountains. Excellent, thank you. So continuing uh, uh, the review, and I'm going to do the best I can to put all the words up at, at right away. Oh, yeah, please bring them in here. I'm going to do the best I can to put all the words up right away so that you can guys just get to writing. Remember, the uh, French and Indian War was a battle over the Ohio River Valley because that was desirable land, a lot of opportunity for farming, growth, plantations, development. Mostly it was just new, and everybody wants the new thing. George Washington was involved in the skirmishes that started the war. So in a way, George Washington was involved in starting the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War becomes pretty responsible for starting the American Revolution. So you might say that George Washington was really involved in starting the American Revolution. Uh, and this all kicks off in the summer of 1754. Uh, summer of 1754. <laughs> Secure Virginia's claims, Washington was sent into the Ohio country, clashes at Fort Duquesne and Fort Necessity lead to the war. Did I miss any questions? Miss just one question on the test? Is that what you're saying? I'm just like live. What's this for? Oh, so yeah. I'll talk about you. I'll talk about your quizzes later. All right, I will post these online like I always do. Got to move on. Got to move on. So after the French and Indian War, this, you know what? England was at peace for the first time in 50 years. They've been fighting their neighbors. Huh? They've been fighting their neighbors in England, in Europe. They've been fighting in the New World. We talked about how you could really call it a global war. And in fact, uh, the, uh, because they, it extended even into the South Pacific, darn near Australia, uh, but this is the first time that England is at peace, but from this, they have accumulated a massive amount of debt. And they decide that the people who should pay for this debt are the colonies in which the war was fought. So they saw uh, an increased taxation as justified, even though, um, uh, now the colonists would see that they were, would say that they were defending the king's lands. But the king, or the crown, is saying that he had sent his people into the colonies, and therefore the colonies uh, should pay for it. But however you choose to look at it, the British felt that they were justified in taxing the colonists because, uh, because all the fighting had happened in the colonies. I understand that sometimes I speak in a way that doesn't exactly follow the notes. So do, do, do what you can to hear what I'm saying, and I'll do what I can to, uh, to make sure I say the key words uh, in the notes uh, as well. So the Proclamation of 1763, it forbid the settlers to advance beyond the Appalachian Mountains. It allowed England to control that expansion. So instead of colonials uh, deciding what was right for them, Instead of uh, local governments, and remember we've been talking about representative governments, 
deciding what was right, what was best for their people. The crown, which was across the ocean, thousands of miles away, they were the ones who had to decide or who retained the right to decide when the colonists could expand. So you could say expansion would be on British terms, so a bit of a check towards the colonial governments. However, if one group appreciated this, it was the Indians because it prevented uh, prevented colonists or prevented the white man, if you will, from expanding into the colonial territories. I know it's a lot of writing. We're gonna we're, just, we're gonna keep on keeping on. Try, I'm gonna try to look across the room, try not to go too fast, but at the same time, if you get behind, just stay you know stay where we are. This road will make sure it will help you get caught up. And guys, this is a, this is a school wide. Uh, shift in attitude about how rigorous education ought to be. Okay, I think uh, we, you know we can't have three years of lost education due to COVID. Two years ago, want want right? We all went home in March, called it good. Last year, there's a whole lot of oh, I'm out for ten days. Yeah, you're not really responsible for that work. Is what it is. Free grade, pass by. You know, moving on. Guys, we got to get back to, uh, to to rigorous study, reading, writing, the pace at which we think, paying attention. So uh, I'm gonna practice that in this classroom. You guys are going to learn that work is due, grades do matter, and you got to you got to keep pace and, and, and you got to catch up and stay caught up. A little bit more about the proclamation. So the overall results are that it failed. Uh, it actually didn't prevent the colonists from expanding westward. It was loosely or even not at all enforced by British troops. So even though it was an official proclamation, even though it was something that ticked the colonists off. It's almost like the king ticked them off and then he still didn't even have the, the guts to enforce it. So in the end, it almost wasn't something that, uh, that really mattered uh, or really prevented the colonists from having freedom. But the idea of it did. So the colonists were, uh, they were keeping score. They were keeping a scoreboard of how many times the king ticked them off. And this one definitely went on the scoreboard, uh, even if they didn't really abide by it all that much. So this has us hanging out in 1763. What's the iconic year? Declaration of Independence, you know, T-shirts, and like, what, what's the iconic year related to related to the American Revolution? 1619 is slaves in Jamestown. Come on, guys! Like the iconic year, 1776. Does that ring a bell? Did I, mean, I just not say the question very well? I want, so I want you to keep in mind our walk up to 1776, okay? Because the Declaration of Independence was declared and signed and put into action in 1776. Really, we call that America's birthday. So every 4th of July, you see that number thrown out again, 1776. I know some of y'all got t-shirts that say 1776. So as we do dates, and we try, we try not to memorize a whole lot of dates, but they are important. I want you to watch our walk all the way up to 1776. So, for perspective, right now we're hanging out in 1763. 1764, the British passed what is called the Sugar Act. The Sugar Act, it was actually designed to uh, to eliminate the illegal, in illegal trade that the, col the colonists were selling their sugar cane into the French and Spanish West Indies, or the islands. We located right about here. Which means that the uh, so what the crown actually did is they strengthened their enforcement on sugar and lowered the tax on molasses. Uh, and what that you know molasses was a sweetener as well. So you could really call it a sugar substitute. That's not the point because the colonists were growing sugar. It hurt them economically by hurting their sugar crop. So it didn't matter that stevia was available for cheap. It didn't matter that sweet and low was still available. They were growing sugarcane, and sugarcane just got taxed a whole lot. Uh, additionally, the uh, Crown established uh, courts, courts of law, in America to start trying the cases uh, that come out of all these acts, and uh, in this ca case, particularly smugglers. So, if you're caught smuggling, uh, if you're caught smuggling sugar and not paying the taxes, the Crown is going to try you in the Americas. So you're no longer under colonist rule. You're not going to be tried by a jury of your peers. You're going to be tried by the crown. Uh, so that's one more, one more way that the king is creeping in on your rights in the colonies. Is that going to make you happy or make you make you mad? 
Yeah, Tyler Thomas, you're going to be real mad about that. Right? Ribs, right? Your ribs hurt. Ooh, you know what? My wife said the same thing me. yesterday. She goes, my ribs hurt. And then I remember why. I did CPR for 50 minutes the other day. So you did CPR on somebody for 50 minutes? All right, then your ribs don't really hurt. Oh, yeah, both Well, you have to do uh, CPR for 50 minutes. They, they already did about 10 minutes. It's true. It's called, it's called a code. They, they. Um, I, I know I got us off track a little bit, but well, welcome, welcome to the world that we're all living in. And you know, just for example, I'm human and I go home, right? You know, my wife's been working at a hospital all day, and she's literally physically exerting herself in a way that makes her exhausted at home. Um, so yeah, you know, I get it. Ribs hurt the next day after you do CPR. Anyway, I totally digress. Uh, another thing the Crown launches at the colonists, remember we're walking towards 1776. So in 1765, this is called the Currency Act. And what is what is currency? Anybody? Money. Money, yeah. So prior to the French and Indian War, the colonists have been printing their own currency. Well, what this does is it requires the colonists to cease printing their own currency, and you can only use uh, royal currency from then on out. So stop issuing paper money, retire all paper money that is currently in circulation. Just another way that King George III is trying to tell you he's in charge and you're not. So do you see, it started with you can't move west of this line. It moved into I'm taxing your way of life. By the way, I'm gonna try you in a court uh, in your homeland but according to my rules. Okay, and that, you know, now we're talking about people's personal freedom. Maybe they go to jail. Maybe they have punishments of some sort. And then now, you guys don't even have a cultural identity that has your own currency. You got to use my currency, and that's it. Well, what do you think the colonial response was to all of these actions? And they were no. getting excited. Yeah. Andrew gives a hard no. Tyler gives a yeah. So that's you good. Get, it's always good when we're up. we have options. Um, killing people. The colonials very much resented the new regulations. Uh, they continued to be at odds with one another. Now, there were distinct regional differences, such as there's colonists in the back country, there's colonists on the coast, there's colonists in the south. A couple of different movements pop up. One is called the Paxton Boys, and they, uh, they're they kind of like a precursor to the Sons of Liberty. Okay? We're going to most remember and study the Sons of Liberty, but the Paxton Boys Kind of a kind of a group of backwoods uh, rebels who uh, uh, um, did things in uh, specifically in Philadelphia to protest taxes, and then there was the regulator movement. Does anyone like use that word today? Like regulators? I think I was a one of my platoons in the military. The uh, like a sister platoon. They called themselves the regulators. Could be like you're keeping an order. Anyhow, the regulators were in North Carolina. They were farmers who were opposed to, uh, to higher taxes. What kind of farmer do you think they were? What was their main crop? Huh? Sugar. Sugar cane. Excellent, Glenn, because they're being directly impacted by, uh, by the Sugar Act. And, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't small in number. Over 2,000 of them took on the, the governor's, uh, a royal governor, remember. They took on the governor's forces. Uh, in what was basically a civil war. I don't like that word virtual. I mean, it was in basically a civil war, not an online civil war. Sorry. Right. There's online. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, in, in creating these notes, one, you're looking for keywords. The keyword, the blanks uh, have words that you need to know. So, your brain catching that word, it matters. Writing with your hand, Hopefully that's locking it in your brain a little bit. And then uh, more than anything else, you are creating your own uh, study guide that you have in your binder for keepsies into the future. The Stamp Act. All right, now, are we? if you didn't know about the Sugar Act, if you didn't know about the Currency Act, I bet you've heard about the Stamp Act before. So, somebody tell me what you know about the Stamp Act. Stamps very expensive. So it is. Let's be real clear. We're not talking about stamps that go on envelopes. Okay? We're, not, we're not talking about the stamp that you use to mail a letter today. What the Stamp Act actually required was to have an official royal stamp on every single sheet of paper sold in the colonies. Almost, and now, almost like you know, if you were little and you had a little sister or something, and they took a little 
They followed a stamp. They put it on the ink pad, yeah. and then they put it on paper, and it made little smiley faces and things like that. You get them on your hand. That's what we're talking That's about. That's the type of stamp we're talking about. And when I say paper, I don't mean dreams of computer paper, okay? We got to remember that uh, paper was far less common. Paper would be used for official government transactions. Paper would be used to print licenses, like a tavern license, a lawyer license, right? So uh, any have those back then. Yeah, no, they did have those back then. They certainly did. And these are the type of things, these are the type of things that the stamps had to be on. Every newspaper, every pamphlet, every bound book. Okay, again, paper is rare, but it's still it's still you, you know, in wide use. And it happens. And a stamp similar to this, and here is actually, you guys know I like to nerd out on primary sources. Here's a variety of stamps that it could have been. Super regal looking. This one's pretty plain. Obviously, it says it's one penny. I mean, I like the skull and crossbones because that's basically saying screw you and your stamps. The stamp itself was not all that expensive, but the idea of it was just one more way that what was happening. One more way that King George was taken over and creeping into your life. Control. So the Stamp Act is, of these early acts, the Stamp Act is probably the most memorable and the most uh, frequently discussed uh, because, you know why? The Stamp Act kind of became a last straw. Now the others, they were building up to this tipping point, but by themselves they weren't the last straw. All of them together and the stamp act it was like the last straw that actually provoked the colonists into uh into into action and patrick henry is known for saying patrick henry is known for demanding a repeal of the tax act or else the king would face a mutiny does anybody know what patrick henry is famous for saying you Patrick Henry, ring a bell? Oh, if you don't know, guess what? I'm not mad. If you don't know Patrick Henry, I'm glad that I get to teach you about him. What's that? That's a different man, but that's a good phrase. Yeah, Patrick Henry was stated, give me liberty or give me death. Now you know? Does that ring a bell? So think about it. I distinctly remember learning about this as a grade school okay younger than you guys are right now and i thought i thought this is a, this is a little it's kind of a reversal of words i thought the phrase was give me everything or give me death and to my fourth grade self it was like take it all <laughs> don't kill me just take it all that's not the phrase though the phrase is give me liberty or give me death and that's a pretty pretty poignant moment in the history of the colonies like let's live free or let's not live at all and you can see, obviously, it's an artist rendition, but this is Patrick Henry rallying his fellow Virginians. He's a Virginian. In the what? What was the elected assembly? From Jamestown. What was the elected assembly in Virginia? House of? Burgesses. Burgesses. He's a member of the House of Burgesses. Okay, that hasn't gone away. What do the well, it's like hairstyle. So, yeah, it's uh, it's like as soon as I give you freedom to dress however you want, you all dress the same anyway. Right? It looks like women. The wigs. I buy that. So, so we have Patrick Henry, and again, it wasn't the the price of the stamp. Now, nobody wants to be taxed, even if it's a penny stamp, right? The price of the stamp wasn't outrageous, but it was the precedent, and again, it inspired Patrick Henry to say, "Give me liberty." or give me death. Patrick Henry is a member of, you ready for it? Society. Sons of Liberty. So now we're talking about the Sons of Liberty. Now we're talking about the Sons of Liberty. They form in response, check out the year, we're marching towards 1776. They form in response to the variety of acts, but again, the Stamp Act was a tipping point. So here we have them forming in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston is going to become a hotbed for uh, patriot and rebel support and for the Sons of Liberty. Now check it out. Check it out. Glenn already caught it. A terrorist organization. Do we have a, do we have a reaction to that word? Look at it. I'll, I'll, bring this, I'll bring the picture a little closer. So they were known to attack, attack tax collectors. In fact, the uh, torture method of the day was called tar and feather. You know what that means? 
That's right. They would either pour or paint. I actually did some really weird research on this last night. They pour hot tar. It would be like ceiling tar. You might use it to bring wood together, building your home, something like that. So tar, not, not comfortable. Probably wouldn't, it wouldn't boil you to death, but certainly not comfortable. But the real torture was the pouring of feathers onto the person. One, that would make them look funny. I should have a picture of that. I'll try to find that. One would make them look funny. But also they would mark them, and it would mark them for a very, very, very long time. You didn't go home, take a bath, and work this off. So the, the tax collector would be walking around feathered for maybe the rest of his life. And I say that because these feathers would grow into the scars that came from the from the burning, you know, the boiling tar. And he would have one scar, the scars are literally feathers grown into the scars for the rest of his life. So this was legitimately torture. This wasn't ha ha, I toilet paper your house. This was legitimately torture. Another method was, especially as it comes to the tea tax, we'll talk about the tea tax in a second, it would be to pour hot tea down, oh, I do have a picture, to pour hot tea down the tax collector's throat, and he's also tarred and feathered. So, I mean, guys, this is this is bullying on steroids, for sure. But, Glenn already caught it. I said the word terrorist. Do you agree with me or disagree with me? Were they a terrorist group? No. They were not? Why not? Because they're Americans and we like Americans? No, because Because terrorists kill people? Do you think the Sons of Liberty ever killed anybody? They probably do. Check this out. I'm, I'm offering you a little bit extra here, okay? Every now and then I have the opportunity to bring a couple of other world events into, even as we're studying in the 1700s. Do you think that uh, it's? Do you think it's? Do you think it's important to know about September 11th, 2001? 9/11. 9/11, right? Now there's a there's an event we can definitely talk about terrorists, right? So check this out. 9/11 is very is more recent history, but it is it is. You may see it on a test, and you definitely need to know about it in the history of your country. Here's what here's the definition of terrorism. So let's go ahead and decide if the Sons of Liberty are terrorists. Terrorism is the use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, in the pursuit of political aims. Yeah, 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 yeah. So were the Sons of Liberty terrorists? I said yeah. the Sons of Liberty. Yeah. They were, you know, I debated this myself. I, I, I struggle with these lessons just as just as we are having information sharing together. I struggled a little bit with this one, because if their idea was to attack a military target, maybe they're not terrorists, they're just a military organization. But that tax collector, he wasn't sold, right? And they did things to uh, elected officials, they did things to, they would do things to civilians who simply supported the British government. So the Sons of Liberty guys, I know this is a big statement, Sons of Liberty were terrorists uh, by the definition of terrorists. So, I'll, let, I'll let you uh, take that one home and chew on that one a little bit. So, in response to the it's colonial, terrible. this is like a double response. A response to the colonial response, the British government did they they had an op, had a choice. They could back down or they could what? Freaking crank it up. They cranked it up. They did not back down. They they cranked it up and they cranked it up through the Townshend Act. I'm going to put all the pictures on the screen while I talk about it, okay? Charles Townsend, fancy word, he was the British Secretary Treasury, okay? So we have a Treasury of, or a, a Secretary of the Treasury in the President's Cabinet. This is, this is exactly what he was in England. He enacted uh, two, um, uh, well, he enacted several things, and here's the names of a couple of them. One was the Quartering Act, which required colonists to provide housing, food, and supplies for British troops in America. And I am, just hang with me, I'm gonna show you this picture. This is what it might have looked like. A British soldier, knock, knock, we're staying here tonight, right? That's what quarters mean, it means you're physically where you live. So, or to quarter someone means to put them up in a household, right? Fancy word, but that's what quartering means. So this picture right here, I mean, we got mom, we got grandma, look, multi-generations in the same household. Dad ain't happy. He's happy. He's probably he's probably trying to think about where his musket is, right? But these British soldiers, they had under under the law, they had every right to do that. So they could just come into your house, mom's cooking supper, and they bust in and 
stuff in there is going to stay tonight. They're going to eat your food over you Shop. eating it. And when they get ready to go to bed, they're going to go sleep in your bed. And good luck on where you're going to sleep. It wasn't just not proper here. We're taking over for the night. I however long they wanted to stay. I hope they have bed bugs. You have, if you had bed bugs and you gave it to them, yeah. that might be a little poetic. So, do you think that the people were happy about this quartering guide for 1765? Well, 100%. They were so happy to share their food. Probably like, pretty angry. Yeah, there, there are several reasons for this. One, it was kind of like, you know, to make the colony start paying for their own support. But two, they just legitimately, there weren't enough barracks in the colonies. Like the British were sending over thousands of troops and they did not have thousands of cots or cabins or houses. Uh, you know, meant for those troops. That, that's called barracks in military terms. So from, from the king's perspective, he's like, ah, just let them sleep with the colonists. Sounds simple enough. From the colonist perspective, I mean, that's just one more match onto the fire that's going to start the whole inferno. So quartering act was one big deal. And then the Townshend acts in general, these were taxes on imports from Great Britain. Import is something that comes into the country. So Lead, that's a metal, paint, paper, and tea. All pretty key components in building anything or running a business, uh, you know, related to farming. Tea, we got to understand how culturally significant, culturally significant tea was. Um, it'd, be, it'd be about like the way people drink coffee today, right? But back then it was tea. So I drink two cups in the morning. And that'd be like saying I got to pay extra for, my, for every single cup I drink. So the tea was pretty significant. A um, little bit more on challenge, and there he is. I mean, he's, 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 like you want to punch him in the face, just looking at his portrait, right? Do you think he had troops staying with him? No. Okay. Yeah, right. No, no bed bug bed, bed for uh, Charles Townsend. Now he, this is a very political politician thing to do. He called them external taxes. He was trying to say it's not affecting individual families. It, this is a tax upon all of the colonies. Yes, ma'am. Oh, it's time for better? Okay, cool. Let me, let me, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me hit the pause button here, and we'll get our bathroom break. So he tried to call them external taxes, but you know what? Call them what you want. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. It was a tax upon all of the colonists. So let's, uh, let's hit the bathroom. Good timing. I'll, I'll hear your questions as we go. What's up? I'm gonna shoot a bird this time. Take a rap, bro. Um, I'm going to like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. I so,
Hey, I appreciate how interested you guys were in the quartering act. I feel like I feel like you really uh, really shook your assumptions about what's normal. Now check it out. The quartering act is a little extra, but I'll talk about the constitution for a second. Did you know? Come on in, find your seat, take a seat. The third amendment to the Constitution is that you shall not have to house any military troops against your will. We don't really memorize that one too much. We know the first amendment, free speech. We know the second amendment. Nate, what is it? Two ways. Right rights bear arms, right? We talk about that one in our society all the time. Third amendment, you do not have to house soldiers against your will. Did you know that? It doesn't matter to us today because that's not... That's not a thing, right? There aren't soldiers knocking at my door, and I go, I assert my Third Amendment rights. Well, I'm on the soldier. But the Third Amendment was so important at the time because they are coming off of this time period where they were literally, you know, being kicked out of their own quarters uh, for soldiers. So this uh, this quartering act is pretty uh, pretty significant. All right, the colonial response to the Townsend Act. You may uh, you may not be surprised to know that they did not appreciate what uh, was going on. So what happened? 1767. Remember, we're walking towards what year? 1776. 1776. Okay, so we're about nine years before that right now. 1767. The Massachusetts Assembly. Boston is in Massachusetts. Circulates circulates a letter of opposition. Basically, an open letter. You might send a letter to the editor these days, right? Or you just send out a tweet these days. But a letter of opposition to the Townsend Act. This letter actually has very, very little effect. It's not like it didn't, to put it in today's terms, it did not go viral. This letter did not get much attention. It didn't have much of an effect. Uh, it didn't really, uh, it didn't really rally the people to uh, to rap, to speak out against the British until this is crazy until the British also circulated a letter basically defending themselves. And at that point, the colonists were like, well, now that you mention it, it was the British circulating their letter that brought attention to the original letter in the first place. So it's almost like the British should have just not had a response. And you know, a lot of times when there's a controversy in the 24 hour news cycle, the celebrity just doesn't even chime in and then all of a sudden it goes away. If the British hadn't even had a response, the people probably wouldn't have noticed. They wouldn't have rallied. But because they kicked out their rebuttal, because they denounced the Massachusetts Assembly, now people started taking note of the Assembly's letter. And the way it works in formal government, you know, you can't just publish your letter to the editor. The whole body has to vote to approve its message. Well, the message did vote to affirm the letter 92 to 17, so that was a pretty uh, resounding response. Got this all written down? Yeah. I just, I think, I found it very interesting that uh, the, the letter didn't get much attention until there was a response to it. And as soon as there was a response to it, then all of a sudden the people rallied behind the message. A little bit more, yeah, that's a great life lesson, see? Uh, a little bit more on the response. So now there's boycotts in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia against the British goods that were a part of the Townsend Acts. So we're talking about tea, glass, paint, lead, and paper. Remember that? Tea, glass, lead, paint, and paper. And in the midst of all this, Charles Townsend, you know, hoity-toity, you want to punch me in the face? 
Charles Townsend dies. Uh, obviously, he, uh, he, he exits the story. And his replacement repeals all of these taxes. So Charles Townsend probably stressed himself to death. Uh, and then in the end, he has no legacy because his, uh, his replacement just repeals all the uh, taxes anyway. But the damage has been done, you could say, because the colonists were, uh, you know, they got all riled up. They got all hot and bothered. And they just got, you know, they got a couple more reasons, a couple more points on the scoreboard for why they hate the king, and they are ready to uh, to rally against him. Pretty good little graphic here. Tax on tea, tax on glass, paint, lead, pencil lead, you might think, and paper. This is the summary of the town tax. We all cut up on that? All right. I call this game Royal Skills. So here's what I'm going to do. I need a king. Can I get a volunteer? Yeah, Andrew. Andrew. Hunter. Eeny, meeny, miny, Hunter. I'll take Hunter. I'll take Hunter. I need two members of parliament. Andrew and Justin. Andrew and Justin. Andrew and Justin. And Nate. Madeline. Can I get you? Be a member of parliament? All right, good. Cootie, Cootie and Madeline, come on up. I wish I had a crown hunter, but we're settled for this. Hunter, Hunter's the king. Sit in the uh, seat of authority here. Madeline. Members of parliament, one on either side. One on either side, Madeline. Oh, no, no. Yeah. No, it's good. There we go. Now I need two tax collectors. And and Glenn, this is going to be good. Yeah, relax. Like, you're the king. You can do anything. All right, so a tax collector, one on either side. Why don't you get a Come on, one right here. Mr. King Man. Keep that. Okay, go ahead and open your pack of Skittles and put it in a cup. Let's make the small effort at san sanitariness here. Everybody's going to get a cup here, okay? Everybody's going to get a pack of Skittles in a cup. Go ahead. Put your Skittles into the cup. Get those into the cup. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Royal Eminem is such a better game. I know. Right. Okay. You want one more? <laughs> you know what, King Man? You get, you're just going to start double, all right? King, the king's going to start double. Yeah. Hey, hey, all right, here's the deal. Hey, so hey, in an effort for some, like, sand, sanitary and all that, like, I'm doing the best I can here. Tax collectors, here's the tool. I'm here to explain in a minute. Tax collectors, here's the tool. All right. So everybody's starting about even, right? Like how many how many skills you got? Can you eyeball it? Is it about ten or so? Like I don't know. How many are in these fun size packets? I got like thirteen. You got what? Thirteen? How many you got? So I know we're all we're all starting at about the same, right? You know, depending on how many got put into the package. So let's call this similar to all colonists having, you know, a generally equal income. I know, like, the bookkeeper might make more than the farmer and the merchant. Like, but let's just say we're all kind of starting about the same with income, salary, household expectations, all that kind of stuff, all right? King, hand, chilling, you good? Yeah, okay. Now, keep in mind, he's on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Parliament, Parliament is what? Let me make sure we understand that. The lawmaking body. It's so yeah. Congress, right? But they call it Parliament. So, Congress, raise your hand. You guys are located where? England. You cross the ocean as well. Tax collectors. Far and better. Far and better. Far. Tax collectors. Where are you located? America. America. All right. Well, hey, crown man, uh, king guy. Go ahead and go ahead and read this one for me. All red shall be returned to the ground. Oh, say it again louder. Everybody listen up. All red shall be returned to the ground. Okay, tax collectors. All red Skittles. 
have to get returned to the crown. So go, go get all the red skittles. Use your spoon. Use your spoon. Use your spoon. Jackson, here, Andrew, here's like a second cup for you. Yeah. Like, Limbo, collect your taxes. So tax collectors, kind of, you know, do about half of the room. I know we're not sitting on a divided line necessarily. Oh no, they're returning to the crown. All reds go straight. All reds go straight to the ground. All reds go straight to the ground. Limbo, use that second cup to collect your taxes. There you go. You got your personal income, but use that second cup to collect your taxes. Cody, come here. Come on, we got, we got all the reds. Got all the reds. Tax collectors, you need Andrew. He's already been there. Tax collectors take half the room each. Trying to be efficient. Hey, where do all the reds go? You think you get to keep those? You crazy? All reds go to the crown. Yeah, royal and stuff. Royal and stuff. Oh, hear ye, hear ye. The king has another decree. Oh, yeah, we have to Yeah, tax collectors, you don't get to keep your reds. Are you crazy? Parliament, give your reds to the crown. All reds go to the crown. What part about all do you not understand? All reds go to the crown. What part of all you understand? Are we there yet? Kingman, you got all the reds? That's funny. All right. Oh, hear ye, hear ye. The king has another decree. Levy your decree on the colonies. If you are wearing jeans, minus three. Jeans with holes, minus four. If you are wearing jeans, you owe three to the tax collectors. If you are wearing jeans with holes, you owe four to the tax collectors. So, don't put it in your purse. Give three to yeah. the Hey, tax collector. Have your tax collection cup. Doesn't matter what cup. Tax collector, need your tax collection cup. All right, let me deal with it. We dealt with all the jeans. All right. Give the jeans. Now, Andrew, you got to take three out of yours. All right, go on. These tax collectors are thinking. They keep trying to get out of it. Please don't exit. Anyone have the key to the hole? That's going to go for next class. Oh, hear ye, hear ye. The king has another decree for the colonies. If you play a school sport, minus two. School sport. Declare yourself. Declare yourself. Hey, tax collector. This man, this man, capping. This man be capping. He's literally wearing his jersey. This man be capping. Cody? Cody don't play. Cody got a jersey in his bag right now. He plays for He's just a bitch. That's not funny. Yeah. All right, let's check it out. Hey, Jackson, how many did you get? How many did you get? Four. Four. Parliamentarian, man. You're trying to steal from the team. All right, tax collectors, check this out. Hey, tax, tax collectors, I want you to keep one of those for yourself. Keep one of those for yourself. Okay? Keep one of those for yourself. That's like a 10% tax, okay? One for yourself. Did you keep one for yourself? Get that back. Messing up my simulation. I want you to give two to each of the parliaments and then the rest of the kids. We can give two to each of the parliament members. Oh, 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 the king don't get any. Okay. That's not okay. That's how many you had this summer. Hey, you good? Okay. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. Out of money. Hear ye, hear ye. The king has a decree. If you have a cell phone, pull it out and wave it around. If you have a cell phone, pull it out. Pull it out. If you have a cell phone, pull it out. Wave it around. You got a cell phone. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out my cell phone beeper. 
Right, go get two from everybody that's got a cell phone. Go get two from everybody that's got a cell phone. I don't got a cell phone. Don't, get, don't you let them be capping on you. I don't have a cell phone. Don't you let them be capping on you. 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 Don't you let them be capping on we got about 15 each. Yeah, she got about 16. She got about 16. King, let's see it. King George, let's see it. Let's see it. Hey, break it. Make sure they're not lying. Hey, she got a phone ticket. She got a phone ticket. Someone turned their phone into me. Like you didn't want to pay the tax, so you turned the phone in. But it's you. All right, now, so again, tax collectors, I want you to keep 10%. I don't know about how many that is. One, if it's not, you know, 10%. I want you to give a 10% take to Parliament. So is that one or two, maybe? I got four. Two. And then the rest goes to the king. You guys see what's going on here? Tax collector gets a bonus every time. Parliament gets a bonus every time. Oh, and that king, that king's about to have diabetes. He's like in the jet. I'll hope you can. All right, we situated on that go around? All right, hear ye, hear ye. The king has a decree of his own. Go for it. I'm wearing black. If you wear wearing black, you owe him three. He made that one up on his own. Black of any sort? Are we, are we getting real rigid? Black of any sort? If you are wearing black of any sort, head to toe, head to toe, you owe him three. I think we should have a tax on crops. Tax on crops. This man says he's going to eat all his before you have a chance. You better quit him. You might want to put him in the county lockup. He's in black of any kind. All right, tax collectors, tax collectors, you take ten percent. Give ten percent to Parliament. Give the rest to the king. I got three. So I, I, I think if your name is better, you have to go five. If you have a last name, you're all out of it. All right, all right. Hear ye, hear ye. Last one, last one. If you're a 10th grader, you owe me two. 11th grader, owe him one. 10th oh, right. oh, grader's owe him two. 11th grader's owe him one. Good thing I'm a freshman. Tax collector, don't forget yourself. I'm a freshman. Don't forget your kickback. I'm a freshman. Yeah, I'm a freshman. I am a freshman. I feel that. Fucker. And I'm a freshman. I'm in a red so Eric is four. Eric only has one. All right, so that's part of yeah, the tax collectors get 10%. You know, on this one, what, what's your tax box? This is your taxes? Okay. The tax collector gets 10%. On this one, Parliament gets 40%. And then the other 50% goes to the king. 
Yeah. You do the math, Tex. Hey, oh, 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 that's another moment. I just gave him four. I don't know how many numbers you're coming up on. What's up, Sad, yeah, we. Sad, sad. Y'all give us three on 10%. Tell me y'all. It's a dodge. Hey, Walton. Thank you, Parliament. Thank you, Parliament. Tax collectors, get on in there. All right, so check it out. Check it, check it out. Tax collectors, king, and parliament uh, pose as you see fit for your status in life. Colonists, pose as you see fit for your status in life. See, I was back here because I'm Sad like, oh, Eric with his one little skittles. I was back here because I'm All right, all right. Now let's not miss it. So go ahead, combine, combine your total. Tax collectors, how many do you have? And you, you can't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so tax collectors, he started with an amount. Now he got taxed some as well. All things considered, I made like four two. All things considered, our tax collectors have made a living. They've made a living above their previous standard of living. Parliament across the ocean in England. About how many do you guys have now? So about a 35% increase, right? What do you mean? The king's going to have well, Get what you owe. Get what you deserve then. Now, Kingman, hang on. No, Kingman, 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 Eric the Red, Lee Erickson, like whatever you are. How many you got? He said, what he said earlier is I can't even count. I'm so rich, I can't even count. Right? Yeah, I hope you get diabetes. So, so let's not miss it. Let's not miss it. Do you see how the colon, oh, oh, sorry, one more category. Colon is how many you got? One, two, three. <laughs> I got four. Somehow you'd be captain. Hey, uh, you didn't turn in your school jersey stuff, though. Oh, I'll be yeah. heavy, heavy, and I'm going to be You weren't wearing jeans? So, uh, you, uh, so uh, you all, yeah, you all decreased, uh, right? Hey, one way or another, you all decreased yeah, pretty significantly. Some more significantly than others. Yeah, so, I'm proud, I'm proud, I'm proud. The take here, how do you think? The colonists would have responded to taxation similar to this exercise. They would have saw you come in the door and they would beat your brains with a baseball bat. I love it when I put people in power and they just love me in power. So, okay, so check it out. I'm going to get my head. Here's what I'd like to do to tidy up the actual fun of the exercise. Hey, to tidy up the fun of the exercise, try to make sure everybody has about the same amount of skills so you can eat them, okay? So y'all that have some extras, make sure everybody gets about that 10 or 14 or whatever. If you don't want to eat your Skittles, I get it. That's fine. But we did try to not touch it with our hands, okay? Because of my taxes. You better. I wouldn't be walking down the street. So redistribute. Redistribute the wealth. Make sure everybody gets a chance to eat your Skittles. If you don't want to receive your Skittles back, that's fine. I understand. I ain't having any if you feel you got chips and you need an alternate candy, I can give you one. You guys like that? Is that fun? Okay. Don't miss the learning point, right? So when you arrive, when you had arrived at a, at a test type question about taxes, I'm going to expect you to fully recall this exercise. Remember how you felt? Remember how the colonists felt? And get that test question right. Okay, go, go back, Minions. Go back to your former life. Go back to your former life. You You're done. Why don't you throw your Hey, let's give you up. We got to tuck back in. We got to tuck back in, okay? Get to your notes. We had the fun. We made the point. Let's not uh let, let's not lose the rest of the hour. We, we still have some stuff to get to. Right? Right. Hey, that was uh, let me say that was good. Okay, I appreciate your participation. I think we made the point. So you guys already said it. You ready to fight? You ready to hang things? You ready to burn things? You hate them people across the pond. So one of the precursors to the actual war is what's known as the Boston Massacre. Here we have 1770. Remember, we're walking ourselves towards what year? 
1776. So here's the story of the Boston Massacre. Here's the story of the Boston Massacre. So this actually occurred before the colonies knew that the Townsend Acts had been repealed. So they're still in the midst of being angry. And you know, let's be honest, I'm not sure that the repeal really would have changed it for them anyway. As the story goes, here's the, here's the story that gets publicized. Boston citizens are going about their regular normal lives. British soldiers march out into the streets, point their weapons, are ordered to fire, fire into a crowd, and a massacre happens. How many people dead? How many people have to die to make it a massacre? 18,000. 18,000? Only seven people died. 1,000. 100? In your opinion, how many people have to die for it to be a massacre? 20. 100. 20? 100? 10. Okay, okay, okay. Ready for this? At least seven. Ready for this? Seven people died. You want to know how many people died? Four. Five. Five people died. So is it a massacre? Or was it an incident? Now, check it out. Remember, the way I said it, the public story was that these soldiers, they walked out, they leveled their weapons, and they fired. I mean, you would probably call that something like firing on civilians. You'd call, you'd call it a war crime. You might call it murder. Here's what's more accurate, right? And again, this doesn't. This is not the story that gets told at the time. The story that comes out across the rest of history, this is what's a little bit more accurate. These British soldiers... We're being, we're, uh, we're being harassed by the civilians. These British, these civilians were throwing snowballs at the soldiers. It was a snowy day. These snowballs were packed with ice and probably even bricks or rocks. So the soldiers were having these things chucked at them, pelted at them. In the chaos, hey, in this chaos, a few British soldiers started pointing their weapons around. In pointing their weapons around, they were actually the youngest and newest soldiers. They were not well trained. In the end, we don't exactly know what happened, but several shots got fired. Once one shot got fired, two shots got fired. Once two shots got fired, ten shots got fired. That's how chaos happens, right? And unfortunately, in the end, ten people died. Ten people from Boston died. This is what more accurately happened. Now, there, however, it becomes a rallying point in America for how the British are greatly oppressing uh, people, citizens in Boston. This is actually a piece of art that was done by none other than Paul Revere. Now, we know Paul Revere for his famous Midnight Ride. But he's actually an artist, and he was a wood, wood printer. Uh, so this this representation is actually by Paul Revere. So he had a big part in the uh, the American Revolution. And what we see depicted is the story that they want to tell, right? British firing at civilians, blood in the streets. The civilians aren't doing anything wrong in the first place. That's the story they want to tell. Here's another representation. Obviously, it shows that the uh, the British are bad. The civilians are being massacred. Looks like one guy's kind of rising up against, but he would be held as a hero, not as a bad guy. One of these five people that got killed at the Boston Massacre is a black man. He's actually half black, half Native American. So he's got a lot of minority going on. He kind of represents all the minorities in America at that time. He's, uh, he's depicted right here in this photograph, with this painting. His name is Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks becomes essentially a martyr for the revolutionary cause at this time. He becomes the first, what, what people say is the first person to die in the Revolutionary War, even though war wasn't declared yet at this point. A lot of people say that Crispus Attucks was the first person to die in the Revolutionary War. And they kind of make it notable that he's half black, half Native American, because it represents the melting pot of America. Okay? We're, we're going to fight for all colors and all represent, you know, and I know there's plenty of fuzziness in there about the fact that slavery is still going on, believe me. But the fact that he was a uh, black man gets, gets elevated in a way that people, uh, people think it's a cause that can rally for all people. Uh, I mean, it's a different bloodline. I look. What's up? That's a good question, Steve. I mean, you're in 
All right, so here's the big takeaway. The soldiers who were tried in the, in the, uh, or these soldiers, again, like I said, they were young, they were inexperienced. According to testimony, they were not ordered to fire, but it was more like, it was more of a nervous mistake. Hey, you got to kill me with the cuffs, all right? Like, if we can't, if we can't be in class with, with trinkets, then we're going to have to stop doing fun things. These soldiers were tried. They were found guilty of manslaughter. Manslaughter means, yes, the thing happened, but you didn't do it intentionally. Okay, so a lot of times a car wreck that has a death might be, uh, uh, might end up with a manslaughter charge. It means someone died, but you didn't do it intentionally. I know that's getting fuzzy on the legalness of it. So it was manslaughter. However, it was declared to be murder by the colonial propaganda. And, of course, that whips up the colonists into a tizzy. They, uh, they get real excited about the British murdering their people in the streets. Got to put this story on a fast forward. So the committees of correspondence, we uh, we read about them in our article. They were proposed by Samuel Adams. They became part of the resistance movement in the 1770s. Remember, we're walking our way towards what year? 1776. The spirit of 76. Thank you. If, if, at least Glenn knows that. Uh, he proposed these committees to publicize the grievances against England throughout the colony. However, it really didn't catch on. It kind of just becomes a Boston thing, uh, and it really turns into a propaganda campaign. Today, we might say fake news. I'm not going to go any deeper than that, but Sam Adams was kind of the original uh, uh, poking the bear, stirring the pot, trying to spread a message that was a little bit more propaganda than it was truth. Uh, and this is the Sam Adams of the Sam Adams Beer Company. So if uh, you ever see Sam Adams on the shelves, and it looks like that. We're talking about the son of liberty, Samuel Adams. He is cousins to John Adams. So if you hear both Adams, if you hear the Adams names, they are cousins. Now, let's get a little deep here for a second. There's a psychology to the revolt here, okay? So people are walking their way towards being willing to have a rebellion. Several things have happened across the past 150 years. We didn't just wake up to this. What is one of the things that has started to get us there? What's another type of revolution or rebellion that this area has experienced? What's that? Hey, you guys are killing me now. Hey, this dull roar, it's got to stop. The dull roar, it's got to stop. Okay, so we, like the, the humming, the dull roar of y'all talking, it's got to stop so we can focus on what's going on. Adam, what did you say? Bacon's Rebellion is a great example. Yeah, indentured servants and eventually slaves. What else? Whatever, like mega theme. That's a specific rebellion. How about this? I'll just I'll take us there. Religious, religious movements. The Puritans were essentially rebels, right? They left England to try to uh, to try to start something new. So that's rebellion. Uh, foreign, actually, we haven't talked about this too much. I won't elaborate all that much. But there was there was turmoil inside of England as well. The English Whig Party was standing up against the Tory Party in England. So England is experiencing a whole lot of rebellion, both at home and in the colonies, as well as political. Uh, hopefully your world history class talked about the Enlightenment, John Locke, Rousseau, uh, Adam Smith, right? This is a new way of thinking about humanity. It's a belief that people are very capable. Uh, it's almost like a, a departure from divine uh, obsession, your obsession with religion and moving towards people's uh, humanism. Anyway, Enlightenment thinkers had a big influence upon Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, uh, and politics in general at the time. So these are what has set the stage for, uh, for revolution. Uh, it didn't come just out of the blue. However, a lot of these arguments found very, very, very little sympathy in the English court of public opinion. You know, the, uh, the colonists may be willing to bleed and die for these reasons, but the English at home, across the pond, they, they, you know, they, they, they just thought they were uh, little PR colonists who weren't, who weren't behaving. Here's another big thing. The idea, you've heard this phrase before, the idea that the colonists could be taxed, but they didn't have a representative in parliament. So the phrase becomes no representation, no taxation without representation. This phrase is said, Dram, last time, before I break up that part. Because I got to see here and I got to see here. That'll get you two away from me, get you four away from each other. Deal? 
No taxation without representation. It's said by this man named James Otis. He's not quite as famous as Sam Adams, Ben Franklin, Patrick Henry, but he's a he's a founder. Okay, he's a key leader. James Otis says taxation without representation is tyranny. A little bit more memorable, no taxation without representation. Now, some would say that their interests were represented, but they didn't have actual representation in Parliament. So they didn't believe that that they should be able to uh, that Parliament should levy taxes without them even having a say inside of the uh, organization. Here we got James Otis, taxation without representation is tyranny. A little bit more on the psychology. So we gotta, we gotta decide where does power ultimately lay. The colonists would say that parliament can legislate for England. They can legislate for the empire as a whole. Remember, that extends into South America, India, even the South Pacific a little bit. But colonial assemblies should make the laws for each individual colony. This is the gripe point. This is the big gripe that we have. The English, on the other hand, they are saying that the empire is the ultimate authority. The empire is single. The empire is united. It is undivided. There is only one authority, not regional authorities, not colonial governments. One authority, the king and the parliament. So we have a collision of ideas here, and we're going to find that they're insurmount it's an insurmountable disagreement. They're not going to come to a negotiated agreement. They're going to disagree to the point of going to war. We have this all jotted down. All right, I'm moving on. You can get it from uh, the classroom. 1773, we have the T Act. Now, T had been taxed under the Townsend Act. Now we're talking about a specific new tax on tea, and it is from this tax that we get what we know to be the Boston Tea Party. The purpose of this tax was really not to punish colonists, kind of like the Townsend the Tax were a little bit more punishment-based. The purpose of this tax was to try to rescue the British East India Company. It was almost bankrupt, so the parliament took away a tax on British tea, but it heavily taxed all other tea. Ideally, this would make people want to buy the British tea because it could come in at a lower price. Thus, you would save the British East India Company. In a way, the colonists got a benefit from that. They could buy cheaper tea. But it was, again, we find the principle of the matter. The colonists did not want the British um, uh, interfering in the colonies. So it didn't matter that they were actually kind of getting a better deal on tea. They wanted the uh, the king to stop messing with their with their colonies. You missing something here? I'll let you do all right, I'm moving on to show. Uh, I kind of already said it. The act was an attempt to save the company, gave the company the right to export tea directly to the colonies without paying any additional taxes. It really would have brought, it would have made tea cheaper in the colonies, but what it did was undersell American companies. So that's that was the great insult. Doesn't matter that tea would have been cheap. Like I go to Walmart, I'm gonna pick the cheapest tea. I don't know if it came from India or Colombia or, or Georgia, right? But that's not uh, that's not the role that they have here. They wanted to buy American. I think a lot of us should really consider returning to that as well. Anyhow, moving on. We've got to move on. We're still on the Tea Act. So the British assumed. I've said okay. I've said this a couple times. The British assumed the colonists would like the, the would like the Act because it lowered the cost of tea. But the resistance leaders argued it was just another example of an unconstitutional tax. So the result is that they boycotted tea. Guys, this would be like, where are my coffee drinkers at? Daily the coffee? This would be like you believing in this idea so much that you forego. You go without drinking coffee. You want to make such a point to the British Empire that you're going to give up that morning caffeine hit because you want to make a point more than you want to consume the illegal tea. Fellow. Hunter, his, his royalness, come back on over here. What's up, T? What you got? What you got? 
So this picture here, I want to elaborate real quickly. This is actually a picture from Disney World. At Magic Kingdom, they have a small portion called Liberty yeah. Square. For a nerd like me, it is awesome, right? It's not it's not really like the Mickey Mouse Magic Kingdom. It's actually it's really a historic little corner of Disney World. And what they have here is these it's almost like a bill that was posted on a sign. And it said it's also historically accurate. It says, stand tall with the sons of liberty, countrymen, support, uh, support with the It says, shun the detested beverage and let none be landed on the shores. This is a bill or a poster that would have been posted all around the colonies. And then it also rallies them to meet at the Liberty Tree. I know that's probably too small for you to see. I just think that's really cool. If you ever get a chance to vacation to Disney World with your family, check out Liberty Square. Uh, and it's almost like you're in Boston at the time of the Tea Party here. So it gets us to the point that the boycott is essentially mobilizing the, the revolutionaries, okay? The boycott has started the, 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 the idea that we're all in this together. Um, and it has increased the role for colonial women because um, uh, these women were actually the principal consumers of the tea. Uh, not to say that men didn't drink tea, but ladies who would stay at home, maybe they didn't have a job because that's what was normal back then, they'd sit around having their tea parties. They were the ones most ticked off, if I can use that phrase, they're most ticked off about this act. So they, they become leaders in the boycott. Women actually become leaders in the boycott. So pretty cool opportunity for women to step front and center in the boycott here. And that creates the daughters of liberty. We have the sons of liberty. Well, the women are going to get involved with the daughters of liberty. Mercy Otis Warren, this is her. She's actually the sister of James Otis, who said no taxation without representation. So we got the Adams cousins. We got the Otis siblings. You know, we got a big family going on here. Uh, these Daughters of Liberty began to participate in things that women maybe normally would do, like protests and riots. We know that some women even carried rifles throughout the Revolutionary War, so I mean, this just goes to show how women were involved. Uh, and then they also did ladylike things, like on the sly, like they passed out pamphlets. They made sure that people were reading the literature, um, uh, because you know sometimes people were just charmed by women, so they'd be more likely to read the literature coming from a woman. Leads us to, this is a major precursor of the Revolutionary War, the Boston Tea Party. What happens at the Boston Tea Party is that Sons of Liberty dressed like Native Americans. Pause. Why do you think they dressed up like Native Americans? Bit of a disguise, one, so they couldn't be pulled into court and people say, yeah, he did it. And then two, really to kind of cast blame on the natives. Yes, so what happened? December 16, 1773, about 150 total men. It was a very organized operation. Uh, they, it was kind of like it was a military operation, basically. They broke into the ships that were housing this tea, right? It hadn't been offloaded yet. It hadn't been brought to market, and they dumped it all into the harbor. Now, now no, no cootie. They didn't drink some, and I'm going to show you why. This, when we say tea, you probably think like a little tea bag, right? The tea leaf, you put it in the boiling water. When we say tea, this is actually what how the tea got packaged. It's a brick of tea. And something like this size, like this is about the size of a Hershey's chocolate bar, what they would do is they would shave it off into their boiling water on a daily basis. It would boil, it would become tea. That was their tea. So a brick like this. They would do little shavings every day. Something like this would have lasted a family for up to a year. So we're not talking about pulling out a little tea bag every single time. We're not talking about boiling a tea leaf. We're talking about like shaving off a, uh, off of off of like this Hershey's chocolate bar. Now, so that, let's let's expand our thought process even a little bit more. So when we're talking about dumping tea into the harbor, they're probably not they're not dumping leaves. They're not dumping Lipton bags of tea. This is what I like to imagine. I like to imagine. I like to imagine them taking a whole brick and like fruit being it into the tea. Yeah, I don't know, guys. Like maybe it's just me, but I like to I like to imagine them frisbeeing this tea off into the harbor. So what happens? So what happens if somebody like snows on something and they pass somebody's harbor? 
Uh, that wasn't that wasn't what they were trying. They weren't trying to steal the tea. They were trying to make a point to the British. Got to get through these next couple points, guys. Okay. So in response to the Tea Party, the the Crown they closed the port of Boston. There goes the whole economy. They reduced the govern. Uh, they reduced all self government. Okay. So they are taking over Massachusetts. The uh, people who are accused of crimes they don't get tried in the colonies anymore. They get tried in England. So you got to take the whole ship ride over to England in order to stand trial. Obviously, that takes you away from your family. It takes you away from people who might understand that you didn't actually commit the crime. That's a big deal. And then this is still going. This is obviously they already done this, but they must quarter the troops again. So what this did was make the colon. This made the colonists of Massachusetts out to be like the most involved in the revolution, and they kind of became martyrs to the rest of the colonies. People be like, yeah, well, in Massachusetts, what they're doing is, and they kind of use that to spark motivation to take up arms uh, as well. It sparked other resistance throughout the rest of the colony. So that's why we think about Boston as this beacon of liberty, the sons of liberty. Everything that starts the revolution kind of starts in Boston because Bostonians, Massachusetts, was the first to really go all in and take risks against the crown. What's up? I'm saying, wasn't the amount of tea they dumped like in currency, like the money today, got like $2 million? Yes, the amount of tea they dumped, today's currency, it was definitely a multi-million dollar type of crime. What's up? Did it turn the ocean into growing It would have, it would have turned the local area into, I mean, I wouldn't have drunk it. All right, two more, two more slides, guys. We're setting the stage for war. I know you guys have crushed it today on six pages of notes, and I'm very grateful for that. First Continental Congress. So the governor has dissolved the, the Virginia House of Burgesses, right? This thing that's been around for 100 years, it is no, it's been dissolved. It's no longer a thing. Well, what that means is they don't have a place to meet officially anymore. And in the absence of that, they create their own. So these representatives called for a Continental Congress that involved not just one colony, but for the first time, all 13 colonies. This is known as the First Continental Congress. To this day, every new election of Congress gets a new number. So I think we're into like the 254th Congress or whatever. This is the First Continental Congress. Uh, all colonies except for Georgia, all right, as we sit here in Georgia, 12 out of the 13 colonies came to the Congress. Georgia did not. The reason for that is that Georgia uh, Georgia still needed protection from the crown against Indians. So maybe you got that in Georgia history, but there's a rational reason, but I'm, all, I'm a little pained in my heart that Georgia didn't participate in the First Continental Congress. At this Continental Congress in Philadelphia, they made four major decisions. They rejected a plan for a colonial union under British authority. They took it off the table. We're not going to make peace anymore. We're in this to try to become our own nation. They endorsed a statement of grievances reflecting the conflicts amongst the delegates. The delegates endorsed this. So they wrote them all out. They made sure we we're all on the same page. They had the tea thing. They had the paper thing. They had the stamp thing. They endorsed this statement of grievances. Got two more minutes. I can do this. Resolutions recommended. Uh, they made resolutions recommending that colonists make military preparations for defense against an attack. So now they're saying, hey, we expect that they might attack us, so you better get ready. And this is where the idea of the Minuteman comes from. Obviously, that's a precursor to the National Guard. So local townships were building a militia. We talked about how militia may be a little bit less trained. you got to bring your own gun to the fight. But they were building militias. They were building Minutemen. And then number four, they agreed to not import, not export, and not consume anything from England. So they're not trading with England anymore. They're not sending their goods over there, they're not receiving goods from England, and they're not consuming anything that comes from England. So tobacco, no more to England. Sugar, no more to England. Clothing, no more from England. Cons consumption, uh, if that's British tea, you better not drink it. They all agreed to this. So they are effectively cutting off their relationship with England. England. I'm going to show you all four of them right here. There's all four. Can you get them? We need one. 
Oh, we need a bottle. Yeah, we I'm killing somebody. Huh? There's another one. Let's see. Let's there it is. There it is. I'm sorry. So basically, they declared an economic war, okay? Through representatives. Not everybody got to vote, right? We didn't have a 30,000 30, person convention. They sent representatives to speak on their half behalf. And whether you agreed or disagreed with those representatives, the representatives kind of got the final say and essentially <coughs> declared an economic war. And the stage is effectively set for war. You got, you're either going to get on board or you're going to die. Join or die to come from the rallies. All right. That was a lot. I appreciate it. If you need to staple your stuff, go for it. Keep these notes. Okay, keep these notes until next week. And go ahead and That was a lot. It was a really good class. King's Candy was an awesome activity.